Hi everyone, welcome to the last lecture of the year. Today we're going to be talking about three different body systems, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, and since we're going over blood and blood cell types, I've also added the immune system to our lecture today. The overarching theme of the circulatory and respiratory systems is their shared function in both nutrient and gas exchange. And so we're going to start with the circulatory system. We will um, compare the circulatory system in humans to other types of animals. We'll move on to the immune system and compare that to other animals as well. And then finish with the respiratory system and breathing in both humans and other animals. All right, now the circulatory system is named as such due to its function which is to circulate nutrients and gases. And the reason we need to circulate nutrients and gases is because our bodies are so large, the surface area to volume ratio is very low. And with a very little surface area compared to volume, diffusion is not a good way for nutrients and gases to reach all parts of the human body. So larger animals, remember they have a smaller surface area to volume ratio, and therefore they need extra help to circulate nutrients throughout. We do that through a heart and blood vessels. So if we were to name this system by the anatomy of it, we would also call it the cardiovascular system. Cardio for the heart, and vascular for the blood vessels. So all cardiovascular or circulatory systems have these two components, whether it's an open or a closed circulatory system. Now, of course, in humans, we have a closed circulatory system with a four-chambered heart, and it's going to be called double circulation because we have one set of blood vessels that goes to, to and from the lungs, and we have one set of blood vessels that goes to and from the rest of the body. So we're going to cover the anatomy of the heart, and talk about the differences between arteries and veins, and then trace the flow of blood throughout the body. So the heart is the muscle that pumps blood. You know that the heart is made up of cardiac muscle. There are three muscle layers in the heart, the endocardium, the myocardium, and I always forget the third one. The, it's not the pericardium. We're gonna forget that for right now. Um, but if you have, for example, my, um, a myocardial infarction, that would be a heart attack or the myocardium layer not working. The endocardium is the innermost muscle layer. And then the pericardium is a, is a tissue layer. It's not made of muscle, but it's a tissue layer that encases or lines the outer surface of the heart. So our four chambers include the right and left atria. In the atria, or atrium for singular, these are going to be the um, parts of the heart that receive the blood. There we go. So our atria are going to be the parts that receive or fill up with blood. And the ventricles are the lower chambers that pump blood. Okay. And there are valves between the atria and the ventricle called atrioventricular valves. That is not a term on your study guide. All right, and then we have two types of blood vessels. Our arteries carry blood away from the heart and veins carry blood to the heart. So in the systemic circuit, or in the circuit that goes to the body, the arteries carry oxygen-rich blood and the veins carry oxygen-depleted blood. However, the arteries that go to the lungs from the heart are going to carry oxygen-depleted blood to the lungs. 
And then the lungs help to aerate the blood, and then we'll have our oxygen-rich blood heading back through the veins that go um, back towards the left side of the heart. And so in our pulmonary circuit, we have a pulmonary artery going to the lungs, carrying oxygen poor blood, and then the pulmonary veins are the um, only veins in the body that carry that oxygen rich blood, the veins that are coming from the lungs and back to the heart. And the capillaries, these are going to be the very small blood vessels that enter our tissues and are responsible for nutrient and gas exchange with tissues. and the cells within those tissues. Okay, now as we talk about the direction of blood flow, we're going to trace um, the flow of oxygen-poor blood, and we will note the names of the blood vessels um, over arrows. So we're gonna start with blood that is coming from the body. And I'm gonna use blue to represent deoxygenated or oxygen poor blood. So we have blood returning from the body to the right atrium of the heart. Okay, and in um, these two blood vessels are going to be the inferior coming from below, and the superior vena cava. Right, in this diagram right here, um, you see that all of the important names, or all of the names of the important um, blood vessels are in red boxes, whereas the um, parts of the heart are starred. All right, so from the right atrium, um, the right atrium receives the blood, it'll pass through the valve, and then it'll go, move into the right ventricle of the heart. From the right ventricle, remember ventricles pump blood, and so it's going to send that blood away from the heart. And so now we're going to be in an artery going away from the heart, but it's going to be the artery, the pulmonary artery, that takes the blood to the lungs. Pulmonary. So one of the only arteries that carries oxygen-poor blood. There are two pulmonary arteries, um, one extending to each lung. All right, so now the blood enters the lung capillaries. And I'm going to switch now to red for oxygen-rich blood. All right, so we breathe in. And as we hold our breath, diffusion um, of the gases goes from a high to a low co oxygen concentration. So blood is going to diffuse from the air into our bloodstream, and CO2 will come out of our bloodstream and exit with the air that we breathe out. All right, so once our bloodstream has been oxygenated and decarboxylated, um, gotten rid of our carbon dioxide or metabolic waste from metabolism, now the blood will return through the pulmonary veins back to the heart. So remembering that veins carry blood to the heart, this time it's oxygenated because it's coming from the lungs. It'll return to the left atrium of the heart. And from the left atrium, the blood will move through the valve into the left ventricle of the heart. And the left ventricle is the largest portion of the heart, and this pumps the blood through the aorta, which goes to the body. And fills our cells and tissues with oxygenated blood, and then of course in our capillaries, you lost track of my line there, our blood becomes deoxygenated and returns back through the inferior and superior vena cava.
Okay, so from any direction that I give you, from the right atrium, from the left atrium, from the lungs, you should be able to tell me where the blood is coming from and where it's going and whether that blood is oxygen rich or oxygen poor. Okay. In the heart, here's an inside view, view of those chambers. You can see here are the valves called the atrioventricular valves that let blood through. Every time the heart pumps, that muscle is contracting and blood is leaving the heart. And so muscle contractions are when the heart is pumping. And so the heart contracting is called systole. And during times of systole, the pressure against our blood vessels is going to be higher. Of the blood against our blood vessels um, is increased. And then when the heart muscles relax in between each heartbeat, then they fill up with blood. And this is called diastole. And the pressure against our blood vessels of the blood against our blood, ves blood vessels is lower. So a single heartbeat or a cardiac cycle consists of the heart contracting, heart muscles contracting, and then relaxing. And during that time, blood is pumped and then blood is received. And a heart murmur can be heard. It involves a little bit of slushing of blood back from the ventricle into the atrium um, due to a slight malfunction in the valve. Most heart murmurs are um, not life-threatening and um, don't make a difference to your qual daily quality of life. All right, so here are some heart statistics. We talked about a cardiac cycle. Um, related to a cardiac cycle is the stroke volume. So the stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped in a single contraction. If your heart muscle is healthy, you'll have a larger stroke volume and a lower heart rate. So your resting heart rate is the number of beats per minute um, when you're sitting and you haven't moved for a while. Your heart rate in general is just the number of beats per, per minute at that particular time, or BPMs for short. Um, so heart rate, number of heartbeats per minute, stroke volume, the number of blood pumped within a single contraction. So then the car cardiac output is a function of both of those, the heart rate times the stroke volume, and it's how much blood courses through the, your body in a single minute. And we've already talked about blood pressure a little bit. Systole is when the heart is pumping. So the systolic pressure is going to be the largest number because the pressure against the blood vessels during contraction is going to be higher. So when you get your blood pressure red, um, it might be something like 110 over 70. Um, that would be a normal blood pressure. Um, and so... Um, the diastolic pressure will be much lower because that is when your heart muscles are relaxing and there is less pressure of blood against your blood vessels. All right, so we have, we've covered the heart, we've covered the blood vessels, and now we're going to talk about the blood itself. So blood is made up of plasma, which is the water-soluble portion, the water and the water-soluble components, and then the cells. There are three types, general types, of red blood cells. All right. All blood cells start out as the same type of stem cell. So in our bone marrow, we produce blood stem cells. And from those stem cells, they differentiate into a number of different types of blood cells. So bone marrow is where the production of new blood cells occurs. Um, and those stem cells are the newly formed blood cells in the bone marrow, but then they will then differentiate into different types. The three basic types are the red blood cells, which are called erythrocytes, erythro for red. And the function of red blood cells is to carry oxygen. So within each red blood cell, the major protein is called hemoglobin. 
and hemoglobin is the oxygen binding protein. We learned a lot about this protein throughout the semester. We learned that it has multiple polypeptide subunits and that in the center of these subunits we have a heme group that holds iron. So iron is a cofactor and that iron is what binds molecularly, oops, not bings, binds oxygen. All right, so oxygen is a nonpolar gas. It's not very soluble in water, so we have this oxygen binding protein to help us get more oxygen into the body. We have our white blood cells. White blood cells are called leukocytes. Um, so um, our white blood cells, their general job is immunity, or they are the cells of the immune system. We're going to learn about a lot of these in the next portion of this lecture. So we'll have many different types of leukocytes. And then our thrombocytes is um, from... Uh, are the platelets, and these are involved in clotting. So make sure you can match the names of the white blood cells to their common names, as well as to their functions. Let's talk a little bit more about the water-soluble portion of the blood. So here's the blood right here. The hematocrit is the um, total cellular proportion. In a healthy individual, that hematocrit is a, like 40 to 45 percent. Um, and in the upper portion, we have the plasma, which contains water and all of the water soluble substances. So, our substances that are going to be hydrophilic. All right, so that includes ions and polar molecules. So we have a lot of ions carried throughout the blood, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, etc., bicarbonate, which is the buffer of the blood. It helps maintain the pH of our blood. And then we also have a variety of water-soluble proteins. Um, antibodies, we're gonna talk about those as well, are small peptide uh, molecules called immunoglobulins. So antibodies fall within the protein class of macromolecules, and they're involved in immunity. And then, of course, we've got water-soluble nutrients, water-soluble waste products like urea. Um, and the, there's also going to be a small amount of oxygen in the bloodstream outside of the red blood cells, but we'll also have carbon dioxide being transported by the blood as well. Many hormones are water-soluble, and they will, all, like peptide hormones such as insulin, they'll be carried by the bloodstream as well. And of course, cholesterol is carried by the bloodstream. Our cellular portion of blood is going to contain mostly red blood cells. If you just look at the numbers here, for every um, million, we have 5 million blood cells for every 5,000 white blood cells. And so most of the blood cells we see in a blood sample will be the red blood cells. And then we will see platelets, they're much smaller, and then the white blood cells will be rare in abundance compared to red blood cells. So fun fact, red blood cells are the number one type of cell in the human body. Neat. All right, that's it for the circulatory system right now. So let's review what we already know about circulatory systems in animals. Uh, so we know that some animals don't have a circulatory system, and that is because they have a high enough surface area to volume ratio that they don't need one. So animals that are very flat or thin can directly exchange nutrients with their environment. And in particular, our cnidarians and our free-living flatworms, they have a gastrovascular cavity. So they've got a mouth. I'm going to 
do that from the body, or let's say here's our mouth, and the gastrovascular cavity opens up into the animal, but it is so branched, so it's a cavity, but with lots of little uh, mini cavities. Um, it's so branched that that really helps increase the surface area um, to volume ratio of the, all of that space. So do, uh, nutrients and gases can diffuse directly into most areas of the body. All right, and then for animals that do have a circulatory system, we learned about animal phyla that had a closed circulatory system versus animal phyla that had open circulatory systems. So for the animals that had open circulatory systems, we had the phylum arthropoda, and we had most mollusks. So the gastropods, the chitons, and the bivalves have an open circulatory system. The cephalopods are the exception. So these are the mollusks that have a closed circulatory system. And our earthworms, chordates like humans, and our cephalopods are the animal examples that have a closed circulatory system. So the general difference between open and closed is an open circuit versus a closed circuit. In an open circuit, the circulatory fluid is just poured into the body to bathe all of our organs and tissues, and then the, the, that fluid then returns to the heart um, when the heart relaxes. In a closed circulatory system, the heart pumps blood through vessels, and then in our capillaries, we have more leaky vessels where the fluid in, exchanges with um, cells and tissues, and then the blood returns to the heart. So the blood vessels aren't open to the body in a closed circulatory system. All right, the other difference between closed versus open circulatory systems is the fluid that is transported. In animals with a closed circulatory system, we have blood. Um, blood binds oxygen and carries it. And we're going to have a separate system called lymphatic system. And these lymphatic vessels will carry our immune system fluid called lymph. So we have a separate immune system or lymphatic system than our circulatory systems. We'll talk about these in just a moment. And in our animals with an open circulatory system, they have no difference between a circulatory and a lymphatic system. They just have one circulatory system. And the fluid that is circulated is hemo for blood and lymph for the lymphatic fluid. So hemolymph is the fluid circulated in animals with an open circulatory system. Okay, now we're going to return only to those that have closed circulatory systems. We're actually going to focus only on those um, within the phylum chordata or our vertebrates. Within the vertebrates um, are chondrichthyes, a ray finned fish, um, these animals have only a two-chambered heart. So it's a closed circulatory system. We have an atrium that receives the blood, a ventricle that pumps the blood, and it's called single circulation because it's just one direction away from the heart and then back to the heart. So we have a single circul circuit that passes through both cap gill capillaries and body capillaries before that blood returns to the heart. All right, so chondrichthyes and ray-finned fishes have single circulation with a two-chambered heart. Then with our amphibians and reptiles, we have double circulation. So now that we're in the tetrapods, tetrapods all have double circulation. And what that means is we have one circuit going to the respiratory system to get filled up with oxygen. And then the other circuit goes to the body.
Okay. The circuit that goes to the respiratory tract is usually oxygen poor, but then returns to the heart oxygen rich. The uh, circuit that goes to the body is oxygen rich when it leaves the heart and then oxygen poor when it, the blood returns to the heart. And so amphibians and reptiles have double circulation, but they have a three chambered heart. Two atria and one ventricle. In amphibians, um, the oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood mix together, and so it's not as efficient as the three-chambered heart of reptiles, except for birds. There's a septum which prevents um, full mixing of the oxygen-rich and the oxygen-poor blood. But the septum doesn't go all the way through, uh, so the um, hearts of both amphibians and reptiles, except the birds, are considered a three-chambered heart. Birds, which are reptiles, our endothermic uh, reptiles, and mammals have a fully separated four-chambered heart with one side of the heart going to the pulmonary circuit and the other side of the heart going to the systemic circuit. Systemic means to the body. All right, another, so the pulmonary circuit is going to be the one that goes to the lungs, to and from the lungs. The systemic circuit is the one that goes to and from the body. One interesting thing about amphibians is um, they, in their larval state, they don't necessarily have, um, might not use their lungs for ventilation, but gills. Um, and then adults have lungs, but they can also breathe through their skin. So the capillaries that go into the skin are also part of the pulmonary circuit. And because it's part of the skin, it's called the pulmocutaneous circuit. So this is a circuit that goes to both lung and skin capillaries. All right, we are going to switch and talk about the immune system now because the immune system involves the white blood cells. Immunology is the study of the immune system or the system of body defenses that protect us against infection. In general, we have um, different types of um, body defenses. We have barrier defenses like our skin and the acidity of our stomach, things that help pathogens get, keep from getting into the body. Then we have other types of innate immune responses that involve things like fever and inflammation. And then we have our very fancy type of immunity, which is based on antibodies. And so we call this an acquired or an adaptive immunity. I'm going to talk about how this forms and relate it to the antibody test that you may have heard about with coronaviruses. So adaptive immunity, this is going to involve antibody response or formation against infections. So we'll go over what that means. And if you form an antibody response to a specific pathogen, um, then you have acquired a resistance to having that infection again. So once you've gained the resistance to an infection, then you are immune to it and the pathogen that causes that infection. Um, our immune system is a system by function, but not by anatomical structures. And what I mean by that is the immune system involves both the circulatory system, because the white blood cells are involved, and the lymphatic system, because we have a separate set of vessels um, that um, circulate this fluid called lymph. By function, we do have one immune system, and that immune system has a function that can be narrowed down into three words. Um, search for circulating our defensive cells or our white blood cells, right? Recognize means that we recognize cells that shouldn't be there by their antigens. 
and then we destroy them, often through phagocytosis or by bombarding them with toxic chemicals or antibodies that inhibit their um, ability to cause infection. So the immune system is a survey and destruction system that gets rid of what's not supposed to be in the body. I'm going to talk about some of the structures of the immune system, some of the anatomical structures. We have our lymphatic vessels, which are separate from our blood vessels. We know that the heart pumps blood through blood vessels, but do you know what moves lymph through lymphatic vessels? Is it the skeletal muscles? Yes, it is the skeletal muscles. Every time we flex our skeletal muscles, that helps move the lymph through the lymphatic vessels. Um, so when, if you're sick, um, you want to make sure you maintain good circulation. Keeping your feet up is one way to circulate lymphatic fluid, but also moving. Moving uh, moderately helps to move that lymphatic fluid, fluid throughout the body. All right, um, and then while the lymphatic fluid returns sterile to the heart or to our bloodstream, right where the um, inferior and superior vena cava come together, that is where the lymphatic fluid returns to our um, circulatory system, right before the fluid enters the right atrium of the heart. So by the time it gets there, it should be sterile, meaning free of microbes. And the reason it's sterile is because the fluid passes a number of tissues and nodes that filter out, separate, and digest any foreign pathogens or other foreign materials. So lymph nodes are clusters of lymphatic tissues, um, oftentimes near openings. So we've got um, lymph nodes in our neck region, um, under our arms, and also um, in our groins. There's a lot of um, lymphatic tissue associated with our gastrointestinal tract. We call that GALT for gastrointestinal associated lymphatic tissue. Then MALT stands for mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. SALT stands for skin associated with lymphatic tissue. So all of the ALTs are lymphatic tissues. All right, and the lymphatic tissues have the same function as lymph nodes um, to filter out foreign materials from our interstitial fluids. I'm just going to say pathogens or microbes. So interstitial fluids are the fluids that are just in our body cavities in between organs. Interstitial fluids. And now we have the spleen. In uh, the rat dissection, right, so let's say like here's the rat. I don't know why I just drew the rat with a beak that's supposed to be its mouth. And then here's the body of the rat with its arms. And here's the abdominal cavity, and it's got its legs. All right, and when you open it up, the stomach's right here. Right, here's the esophagus leading down to the stomach. The spleen is an organ um, to the just to the left of the stomach, or to the right if you're looking at it this way. Um, and the spleen is not associated with the GI tract, even though it's adjacent to it. The spleen is actually an immune organ, and it receives blood every day, and it um, filters out any foreign material that might be found in the blood. So for example, if you have a viral infection, um, there might be viruses in your bloodstream, and your spleen would filter that out. If you... Um, have an inflamed or swollen spleen that could be caused by viruses that are not, uh, oops, undo.
that have not been filtered out. Just like when we have swollen lymph nodes, we might have an upper respiratory tract infection. If we have a viral infection like mononucleosis or mono, um, that you could tell by whether or not your spleen is swollen. And it's on the left side of your body. So right near the upper part of your abdomen, if you feel a lot of swelling in that upper left-hand side, that could be your spleen. All right, now we're gonna learn about all of the different types of white blood cells and what they do. Um, first, um, I wanna show you a picture of what all the blood cells are, and we're gonna go over which ones are phagocytes by giving them a little star. And if it's a phagocyte, that means it does phagocytosis. So not all white blood cells are phagocytic. The neutrophils are, these are our basic phagocytes. Nothing real special about them. They just travel around eating up stuff. Um, so they're pretty basic as far as our white blood cells go. We've got much fancier phagocytes. The macrophages, macro means big. These are gonna be the biggest phagocytes of all and dendritic cells as well. Our B cells and T cells will be form, um, involved in that adaptive immunity that, that I was talking about that involves forming antibody responses. So these are more elite, right? So we've got our elite white blood cells and our B cells and T cells and macrophages and dendritic cells. Then we've got kind of our basic um, soldiers in the granulocytes, which include neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. So neutrophils are phagocytic. Basophils and eosinophils, they um, are often involved in inflammation and allergic responses. and also just the eosinophils, um, but these are also involved in infections that can't be eaten by phagocytic cells. So if you have a parasitic infection and it's larger than a white blood cell, then that parasite can't be um, engulfed by phagocytosis. And so the parasites that I'm talking about are, yes, worms. So our worm parasites like flatworms and roundworms, they can't be engulfed by a phagocytic white blood cell. They are bombarded by toxic chemicals um, formed um, from the eosinophils. So eosinophils are active in worm and also fungal infections. Yeek. So I will point out one more thing about the neutrophils since we're not gonna see them again. I know I said they're pretty basic, so I undersold their value, but they usually are the most abundant type of white blood cell. So they're pretty important. They're mo the most abundant type of white blood cell. And it's a common indicator. So if you have high levels of neutrophils, um, that indicates infection. All right, let's talk more about this adaptive immunity, especially the formation of antibodies. First, I want to talk about what an antibody is. An antibody is a small peptide. It's an immune molecule. And what it does is it'll bind to an antigen molecule on foreign cell surfaces. So these foreign cells could be bacteria, um, or they could be toxins. Which are poisonous chemicals made by pathogens. All right, so the antibodies are the ones that are shown in this Y-shaped region. And how do antibodies help with immunity? They can do several things. One thing an antibody does 
as it when it binds to the cell, it signals to a phagocyte or to our white blood cell, like, uh oh, I did it again. Um, it signals to a white blood cell, like a macrophage, hey, come here and eat me. So antibodies can um, signal or start the process of phagocytosis. That's what this opsonization is, the coating of a cell with a substance so that a white blood cell can come in, attach to that substance, and then engulf whatever is in between it. So antibodies kind of signal like, hey, I'm here, come eat me. All right, antibodies also work uh, by attaching to the microbe and therefore preventing their movement. So, um, and if a microbe can't attach or move, it's not very good at causing infection. So antibodies can kind of slow down pathogens and prevent them from adhering to our own tissues. And then they can also neutralize a virus, which means that if a virus is um, bombarded with antibodies, it can't infect host cells. And um, it can also neutralize toxin, toxins. So the antibodies, so an antitoxin therapy would be kind of an antibody approach. Oh gosh, it's something that sticks to the toxin and therefore the toxin doesn't have the same harmful effect on our cells. So how do our cells make these antibodies? And how do our cells know what antibodies to make uh, because all pathogens have different antigens. So antigens are surface molecules found on cells, and they are unique to each cell type or species. All right, so I have this cartoon um, that came from a Nobel Prize site for education um, that describes how this antibody response forms. And as we go through it, we're gonna talk about four other types of white blood cells. We're gonna talk about the role of dendritic cells. We're gonna talk about the role of helper T cells. And this dendritic cell is also going to be AKA called an antigen presenting cell. And then we're also going to talk about B cells and macrophages. So let's start with a dendritic cell. A dendritic cell is a type of phagocyte. So here's our dendritic cell and it's doing phagocytosis by eating a bacterium. So it's like, I'm going to eat you. This right here is the antigen on that bacterium surface. When the phagocyte engulfs the microbe, it digests it into small pieces. When it does that, it takes the antigen and incorporates it on its own cell surface. So it is taking that antigen and presenting it to another white blood cell by um, holding it on the outside of its little cell body or surface. So because the dendritic cell presents the antigen to another white blood cell, it's called an antigen presenting cell. Antigen presenting cells can be dendritic cells. They can also sometimes be macrophages. To keep it simple though, we're just going to um, go with the dendritic cell here. So dendritic cells are our antigen presenting cells and they eat pathogens and give their antigens to a helper T cell by a direct interaction between um, the dendritic cell and the helper T cell. So helper T cells are one of two types of T cells. What they do is they release a lot of chemicals called cytokines. 
they release a lot of signaling molecules and these signaling molecules will activate our B cells. So helper T cells are activated by the antigen presenting cells. Then they start producing a number of signaling molecules which triggers the B cells into start doing what they do, which will be antibody production. All right, so now we have our third type of blood cell, the B cells. When they are activated, because they have gotten those cytokine signals from the helper T cells, they then differentiate into two types of cells. The plasma cells make a bunch of antibodies, and then they also form antibodies specific for the antigen um, that was delivered by the antigen presenting cell. So they, they find a good match and then they just make a whole bunch more of these antibodies. And now all of the antibodies they make are specific to the antigen that was originally presented by the antigen presenting cell. And the memory cells, which also come from B cells, the memory cells stick around and um, can make antibodies on an as-need basis if they are ever activated again. So these are the cells that have long-lasting memory and can produce the same antibodies again in the future. All right, so the B cells then are the ones that an make antibodies for the pathogens. Once the antibodies are stuck to the pathogen, then that signals the destruction of that pathogen by macrophages. So macrophages are our fourth type of blood cell, and the macrophages right here, they're called the eater cells, they are going to engulf and digest, which is phagocytosis, they're going to engulf and digest these antibody-marked pathogens. Okay, so right now we have an antibody test for coronavirus, and the idea is that if you have the antibodies that means you've somehow formed this immune response, so you must have been exposed to the coronavirus, whether or not you've experienced symptoms. Um, you might not know that, but if you have the antibodies, that could be an indicator that you've had the infection and made the antibodies for it. Our last type of white blood cell that I wanna talk about is our cytotoxic or our killer T cells. Um, like the B cells, this is the T cells are part of the elite force um, of our immune system. They are, um, in addition to our helper T cells, we have T cells that kill or destroy our own cells. So they actually um, identify cells that are either infected or damaged. So like a cancer cell, for example, um, an infected cell could be a cell that is infected with a virus, or it could be a cell that's infected with a parasite, um, like a pro um, malaria, for example, infects our red blood cells. So our killer T cells deli deliver um, cytotoxic or um, chemicals that are toxic to cells, cytotoxic death signals. And what these death signals do is they induce apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So T cells help us kill our own cells when they're not working for us anymore. And these could be um, infected cells or cancer cells. All right, I'd like to go back to immunity and talk about how we can get antibodies. 
there are in general four different ways that we can acquire the this antibody response or this adaptive immunity. Um, the first way is by getting sick, right? So if we get sick with an infection, then we will actively form that antibody response. So if we get sick, we form the antibodies ourselves. Um, we can also receive antibodies um, passively through breast milk or through breastfeeding. This is called passive immunity because we're not making the antibodies ourselves, we're just kind of getting them from our mother. We can also form antibodies if we receive the antigens of a pathogen artificially. So if we get an immunization or a vaccination, then what happens is we are exposed to a part of the pathogen that contains the antigens. This triggers our body to make the same antibody response that it would if we got sick um, with the pathogen itself. So our body is making the immune system without actually having a dose of the live pathogenic organism. So the vaccination is kind of like a dress rehearsal for our antibody and immune response. It gives the immune system time to practice, practice, practice that recognition of the foreign pathogen before actually being exposed to the pathogen itself. All right, so uh, vaccines um, promote immunity without actually having to receive the infection. So when we talk about herd immunity being necessary for coronavirus, we can receive herd immunity, which is when um, 60 to 70% or more of the population has the antibodies. And um, this herd immunity can be received by either vaccinating or by millions and millions and millions of people getting sick and also hundreds of thousands dying. So I prefer herd immunity through vaccination. And that's what we do with the flu shot every year. And then um, finally, you may have also heard of blood donations or plasma donations for people that are um, sick with coronavirus. The idea is that if you have gotten sick and survived, then you have the antibodies. If you donate your blood, then those that um, cellular portion of your blood, um, the white blood cells, um, can be suspended in a solution and given to another sick individual. Um, and so this is kind of receiving the antibodies from someone who is already sick. And there has been, uh, some of this has been done. And that is called a serum. And they lived. All right. So comparing immunity to other animals, I just have one quick slide on this. Um, all animals have some form of innate immunity. Again, that innate immunity would be things like barrier defenses, like the skin, um, some of our neutrophils or our natural phagocytic cells, uh, and um, in inflammation. In terms of this adaptive immunity, which involves antibodies, only our vertebrates have an antibody response. So vertebrates are much more protected against infection than invertebrates. All right, we're finally on to the respiratory tract now. And we're gonna talk about how oxygen gets into the bloodstream. So the function of the respiratory tract is to deliver oxygen into the blood and um, exchange that oxygen for CO2. So take carbon dioxide out of the blood. So every time we breathe in, that O2 diffuses in our blood and CO2 comes out of the blood. Now, where does the oxygen go to in our cells? It's transported throughout the body. It gets delivered to our cells. 
um, it's going to go to the mitochondria because in the mitochondria we have the electron transport chain and at the very end of the electron transport chain is when oxygen is used. So don't forget to review some of your aerobic respiration. Oxygen is going to be used in the ETC of, the, um, of aerobic respiration, which is in the mitochondria. So if you still remember that long picture we drew on the board, oxygen was only used at the very end in that portion of cell, cellular respiration that was called oxygen, oxidative phosphorylation in which we had the electron transport chain and oxygen at the very end of that. Now CO2, where does the CO2 come from? If we think about the three stages of cellular respiration, we don't get any CO2 from glycolysis because from glycolysis we only get 2-pyruvate, but instead we get CO2 from that middle stage, the pyruvate oxidation and the TCA cycle. So the CO2 comes from the glucose um, in our foods, right? Glucose is broken down all the way to CO2. Oxygen um, gets reduced and formed into water. All right, so we breathe in through our upper respiratory tract, which includes our oral and nasal cavities, and then airflow. I'm gonna draw my air in a light blue color. Um, airflow goes through our oral and nasal cavities. It passes through our throat or our pharynx, past the epiglottics, and into the larynx. So the larynx is the voice box. Just want to point out that our sinuses are adjacent to the respiratory tract, but they are not a part of the respiratory tract. So once um, they can drain into the respiratory tract, though, from our larynx, air flows through the trachea, which is also known as the windpipe. It takes air into the lungs and then finally into the lungs, first into the two bronchi that branch off um, from the trachea. Here are the bronchi right here, and then into the bronchioles, and then finally the alveoli, which are our air sacs where gas exchange occurs. All right, and then when we breathe out, the air just kind of goes out the same way that it came in. All right, so when we breathe, we're contracting the muscles of our ribs and, and diaphragm. When those muscles contract, it creates a negative pressure or almost a vacuum that pulls air into the lungs. So um, we ventilate our lungs by this negative pressure breathing, the muscle contractions of the ribs and diaphragm cause that negative pressure and then that pulls air in. When the muscles relax then, the air can go out. All right, and here are the alveoli. You see the blood vessels lining it. And so fun fact, what type? The, these blood vessels right here are lined with epithelial tissue that are thin and flat to allow for maximum diffusion um, of gases. And that, the tissue that lines the capillaries of our, our lung capillaries is called our simple squamous epithelium. The thin flat cells that allow for maximum gas exchange or epithelial tissue. That is it on breathing in humans. The respiratory tract has a very simple job, gas exchange. The circulatory system is what transports that oxygen throughout the body. The respiratory tract just has to get that oxygen into the bloodstream. We had mentioned in unit four that birds had a very efficient respiratory system and this allowed them to get very oxygen rich blood to maximize the amount of ATP that's needed for flight. So I want to point out how that respiratory tract is different than the one we just talked about. 
Briefly, they have air sacs that store air with every inhalation. So when birds inhale, the air flows um, into, sorry, into the post air, posterior air sac from, from the outside of the body and then from the lungs into an anterior air sac. And then when birds exhale, the air leaves the anterior air sac and out the body, but also enters the lungs from the posterior air sac. So two fun facts. What this does is it allows for airflow in a single direction through the lungs lowering the amount of um, mixing of ox um, oxygen-rich air and oxygen-poor air. So um, we've got single flow of air through the lungs and very little mixing with CO2-rich air in the lungs. What I also find really interesting is that the lungs fill up during exhalation and air leaves the lungs during inhalation. I just thought that's an interesting difference uh, between humans and birds. In other animals, uh, remember that in the same animals that don't have a circulatory system, they also don't have a respiratory tract for the same reason, because gas exchange can occur via diffusion if the surface area to volume ratio is high enough. And animals that don't have a circulatory or a respiratory tract include the periphera, the Tenophora and Cnidaria, and the Platyhelminthes. Also, I believe the Nematoda. Uh, for animals that do have a respiratory tract, all of our aquatic inver invertebrates um, will have some sort of, uh, and vertebrates will have some form of gills. Um, so we see gills not just in fish with their pharyngeal slits, but also in annelids. Remember that the um, ocean or marine annelids were called polychaetes, and they have gills on all of their parapodia. Um, so the parapodia have all the chitae, but they also um, function as a gill. Um, we've seen the gills in the uh, dissection of the crayfish. They're very feathery looking. On um, sea stars, um, the gills are um, on the on the top surface of the sea star opposite the tube feet, which um, face below or ventral. So on the dorsal end of the starfish, we have the gills um, mixed in with the spines on the surface of the sea stars or the echinoderms. And then um, in the clams, for example, um, clams are, are bivalves we saw in the um, clam dissection that um, mollusks have gills as well. All right, another fun fact um, about animals that have an open circulatory system. So arthropods and then the mollusks, except the cephalopods, they have an open circulatory system and they also use a different oxygen binding protein. They use a protein called hemocyanin, and cyanin usually refers to a blue-green color, and that blue-green color comes from copper. So in hemocyanin, it's equivalent to hemoglobin in function, um, but this is the oxygen binding protein in animals with an open circulatory system. which are these animals above. All right, everyone, that is it for the last lecture of the year. Um, thank you for hanging in there, for sticking with me, and I wish you all a really wonderful final exam week and a summer. Take care, and I really hope to see you soon. Bye.